Your Creative Push, Episode 334. You are producing something you care about, something you are passionate about, and it'll catch you by surprise. You're happy again. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Jeff Wright. Jeff is a storyteller and a podcaster, and he has created Trojan War, the podcast, as well as Odyssey, the podcast. And he comes on the show today to talk about his journey or his odyssey and how he got to the point that he is today creatively speaking. And normally I give a kind of brief overview of the things that we talk about in the episode But Jeff is such a great storyteller, not just uh, for the Greek epics that he talks about, but also of his journey, of his creative journey. So I don't want to spoil anything for you, but I just want to lay the groundwork that I personally love his podcast. Uh, When he reached out to me, I started consuming Trojan War, the podcast, and I have now finished it, and it was amazing. I, I feel like he is the perfect tour guide for the Greek epics. Jeff really lays out his own journey and how he was on a creative path, but he had to regroup at one point in order to sort of refine his journey. And he found that by continually pushing forward. So I know that it is going to resonate with you regardless of what your creative passion is. And hopefully, you'll also be inspired to listen to his podcast to learn some things and to hopefully be inspired by the Greek epics as well. So please sit back and relax and enjoy one of my favorite conversations with Jeff Wright. Jeff, welcome to Your Creative Push, man. Hey, it's really good to be here. And I've been looking forward to this interview for a few weeks now, at least. No, I've been looking forward to it as well. Um, When you reached out to me, I thought what you do is amazing uh, just on paper. And then I started listening to Trojan War, the podcast, and now um, Odyssey, the podcast, uh, because you you gave me sneak access to uh, the first two episodes. And you have a extreme talent in what you do. um, And uh, we'll get into that in the episode, of course. But um, could you maybe start out by uh, sharing how you got to the point you are today uh, in your creative life? Sure, not a problem. And well, thanks for the compliment about the podcasts. Uh, and that's a good starting point, because if I have any extreme talents at all, it, uh, I get to blame my parents for that. It's sort of quick life story. Uh, grew up in Southern Ontario to a uh, really wonderful family, to highly educated parents. And looking back on it now, when I think about it, I think my mom and dad gave me kind of two things. They gave me my vocation and they ended up kind of giving me my value set. Um, my mom was or is the uh, consummate storyteller. So I kind of grew up in a household where my mom was always excited and enthusiastic about telling stories. So, y- you know, back in school when you were given a piece of poetry and you had to go home and memorize it and then stand awkwardly in front of your grade four class and like recite it out loud. Right. Um, at least we did that inside of, I don't know, I don't know if they do that anymore, but we used to have to memorize Shakespeare and memorize poems. Well, my mom, those were exciting epic events for her. So we would rehearse, we would practice, we would get into character, we would work in delivery. And, uh, you know, then I'd get up in front of my grade four class and uh, blow them all away because I actually <laughs> knew what I was doing and uh, it kind of stuck. So I got into theater, I got into a lot of public speaking contests and My dad was a public speaker too, but my dad was a public speaker who absolutely hated public speaking and showing up in large meetings. And there's a family story that he fainted in front of a huge crowd of 500 people in his first attempt. And what that led to was my dad becoming a bit of a control freak. So he would prepare to public speak by rehearsing it, redoing it a hundred different ways, practicing it with the lights on, the lights off and that sort of thing. And I think between my mom and dad, I ended up getting um, the storytelling thing plus the whole kind of control freak rehearsing in advance kind of thing. And uh, then mom and dad, uh, well, they were high achievers and I ended up getting the gift or the curse of their unrelenting standards. (laughs) Yeah, the standards are something that I think we all deal with. And (laughs) certainly from from my parents, I received that as well. But uh, I think a lot of people can relate to uh, 
if you don't have your self-imposed standards, then you have it from somewhere else at least. Yeah, I didn't – it's kind of weird. You know, I never – I don't think you really realize I grew up in a house where my parents were just overachievers and they never ever said anything overtly like, hey, go out there and overachieve and do your best and you're expected to. It was just sort of, um, it was a quiet underlying assumption inside of the way that the family was raised that uh, if you're going to do something, well, it damn well better be the best it can possibly be. And it's sort of, I was an eldest child, so all that birth order stuff, I ended up becoming kind of that guy that... uh, was going to have the unrelenting standards. And that was going to be, that's becomes a major issue in my creative life later on, which is why I mentioned it up front. Um, so uh, yeah, by the time I uh, had left home and everything like that, I knew that I was going to be doing something on a stage and I was going to be telling stories and I was going to have this little unrelenting standards problem. And that catapulted me into becoming a high school teacher. And uh, it's perfect because there you don't have to worry about an audience. The kids have to sit there and pay attention and pretend they're interested. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great place for somebody that likes to talk. And uh, I, I had a fine time. I taught, uh, taught high school, humanities, philosophy, history, politics, you know, all of the places where you could turn the content into a story without too much trouble and uh, did that. So that was sort of early years. And I rolled through loving high school teaching and, Everything like that from the time I started in my very early 20s until I hit 41 years old. And then I had a big downhill ski accident and bang, my life changed. And that sort of becomes like, I guess, if you will, act two of my story. Uh, Kind of uh, act one is birth to 41. Act two was the massive head injury and concussion and spending a decade in the wilderness, I guess, trying to figure out what to do about that major life change and Then about five, six years ago, I kind of figure I entered act three and uh, it's all kind of coming together now. So there, that's my life in uh, sort of three (laughs) acts. And I guess since I've been deeping into Greek Greek epic lately, uh, I'm seeing everything as sort of three act journeys. (laughs) Right. You're in deep. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you uh, take us back to act two then? Um, So that injury happens and... Uh, you couldn't teach anymore. Is that what happened? Yeah, a kind of quick version of it is um, I I was a pretty good downhill skier and I was instructing on sort of in the side for fun when I was teaching and taking all my high school students off once a week up to the local downhill ski slope for ski club kind of thing. And uh, just one night in February, I was giving a lesson on a side of a slope with a beginner skier and out of the blue, some snowboarder came barreling into me from behind. And uh, he was kind of in one of those tuck positions you are as a snowboarder. So he crashed into my back from behind without me realizing it. And my head went flying back and crashed into the backside of the mountain. And Mm. my helmet did a perfect job of protecting my skull. So it didn't shatter, but helmets don't do anything for concussions. And so, uh, the doctors tell me my brain went way, way back forward till it hit the back of my skull, smashed against the back of my skull, and then in a panic went flying forward on the rebound in uh. the front of my skull, and um, I had a concussion. Um, but Young, and the really cool thing about it, concussions is that I didn't know I had a concussion. I stood up. Uh, I turned to the guy who was still whipping down the hill and hadn't bothered to stop and saw he was wearing like big ass headphones and smoking a doobie <laughs> at the same time and um. thought, there's your snowboarder type. <laughs> and so my first uh, kind of words of my entire brand new life to come where I kind of saw him going down the hill and I screamed out, asshole. And I kind of <laughs> wish now I had said something a little bit more profound when I realized <laughs> that my life was going to change. But uh. the second half of my life was defined by asshole as sort of the first words out of my mouth. And I didn't know I had a concussion until about four hours later that evening. And we were boarding the bus to bring the kids back home uh, at the end of the night of skiing. And one of my buddies, a colleague, kind of approached me and said, "Uh, Jeff, I know it's not like you, but the kids are talking. Uh, Did you have a couple of drinks in the bar? And uh, I said, no, I don't drink when I'm supervising field trips. Uh, Like, what do you mean? And he said, well, the kids say you're slurring your words and you can't remember anything. And the rumor's going around that Mr. Wright's drunk. And so Mm. um, it turned out Mr. Wright wasn't drunk. He had a head injury. Uh, So, yeah. So that's how it started. Wow. See, that's uh, that's, in an instant, everything can change. It's so uh, scary. Yeah, but... The interesting thing about, uh, I've talked to a lot of people with concussions. They're, they're a pretty common injury these days. And 
I, I actually do a lot of going out and talking to uh, concussion survivors. Sounds way too dire, but but I, I go and talk to people that are at a different stage in the journey that I am because uh, I can be of some use. And I do some public presentations and storytelling on it. And uh, one of the things I've discovered is most people don't kind of go, oh, wow, my life has changed. Uh, most of the things that I guess there are things that change in your life and you know right away. But my concussion journey then was really a matter of a whole heck of a lot of denial over the next year as I kind of figured out what was going on. And uh, I didn't know I'd been concussed. I didn't think it was anything big. And this happened to me back in the years before concussions became fashionable, if you will. And so uh, none of the big sports stars had publicly come out with their concussion stories yet. And the protocols hadn't been set up. And the NFL hadn't launched its investigations or its studies. And up here in Canada, the, the National Hockey League was still in complete denial that concussions were a thing. So Everybody just thought, oh, Jeff got his bell rung. Uh, you know, take a day off, uh, you know, go easy for things a bit. Maybe, you know, have a drink before you go to bed, you'll be fine. And so the start of my journey was not, it's not like I woke up the day afterwards and thought, wow, life begins now. Uh, that was about a year of figuring out what was going to be happening to me. Right. Well, then take us into act three. <laughs> what, um, <laughs> what got you into yeah. the idea of, of storytelling and kind of uh, teaching in a different way, like a very, an educational way, but a very entertaining way as well? Um, that was a whole series of act two sort of trial and error things. Um, I, I went back to work with the concussion and realized pretty quickly over that year that I couldn't keep classroom teaching. The trick I found was that the nature of the brain injury I ended up with was really kind of weird. I, it didn't reduce my cognitive abilities at all. It didn't reduce my motor skills at all, and it didn't damage my memory at all. So I had this weird little injury where what ended up happening to me was that I could do anything I could do pre-concussion and ski accident, but I could only do it for a very limited amount of time. And if I went beyond that limited amount of time, then I'd get these debilitating, like mind-numbing headaches, which would just shut down all of my cognitive and my motor skills completely. So the start of the sort of post-concussion journey was... Um, well, I, you know, standard high school teacher teaches three classes. And so I started out teaching three classes and I'd realized that I was making myself really, really sick. So then I'd move down to teaching two classes and, and I tried teaching two classes and then going home and sleeping in the afternoon. And after six months when that didn't work, I went down to kind of teaching one class and trying that out. So my guess is an awful lot of human beings um, that face these sort of big life changes spend a fair bit of time post-change kind of fishing around in the bargaining process, trying to say, how much of my previous life can I hold on to or get back to? And that's a stage of the journey that I had to go through before I woke up in the morning and started even thinking about, hey, there's other ways of doing this job. Um, I've listened to some of your other folks that you've interviewed, and it seems to be a fairly standard story arc. It's not, oh, got a bad concussion. Uh, let's be logical about this. Wake up tomorrow. I can't do my job. Okay, so let's sit down with a piece of paper and come up with a new plan. And mm -hmm. um, there's there's all of those things that the psychologists call bargaining and denial and grieving that sort of happen before you can ever get anywhere near moving on to that new plan. So I spent a lot of time struggling with that kind of stuff at the start. Uh, <laughs> Do you know the Do you know the Monty Python uh, movie, the the Holy Grail? Sure, uh, sure. Bit of a classic. Okay, it's one of my favorites. Uh, scene in that movie that kind of defines, I think, what well, what happened to me post concussion and trying to figure this out. There, there's uh, King Arthur is trying to cross a bridge, and there's this black knight guarding the bridge, and the black knight stands there and says, "None shall pass." And um, so Arthur realizes, well, I'm going to have to fight this Black Knight. So Arthur approaches with his sword and Arthur and the Black Knight fight and Arthur summarily cuts off the Knight's sword arm. So now you've got this big gaping flesh wound and blood spurting out. And Arthur gamely says, well, well done, brave Knight. And now let me pass. And the Black Knight turns around, uh, picks up his sword with his good left arm and says, tis but a flesh wound and starts to fight again. 
Mm. And Arthur, of course, has to then cut off that arm. And then the Black Knight uh, starts kicking Arthur with one leg. And when that leg goes, he kicks him with the other leg. And eventually he's there trying to headbutt Arthur, but refusing to give up his job as the Black Knight who guards that pass. And um, I spent most of the first two years post-concussion being the Black Knight. <laughs> mm. um, I, I show up at work and when I couldn't teach full time, I'd try teaching two thirds time. And when that didn't work and uh, the concussion pain got worse, I'd try teaching one thirds time. And when that didn't work, I'd uh, eventually they had me down into a classroom teaching 10 hand picked top notch students. And I would go in, I'd teach them for one hour and 10 minutes and uh, leave it all there for an hour and 10 minutes of brilliant teaching. And then barely be able to drive home safely before I collapsed and had to spend the rest of the day in bed. So it, the early stage of it was struggling to kind of figure out, well, what are the limitations of this injury? What can I do? What can I not do? And uh, I think it was the day I was, there was a day I taught from nine to 1030 in the morning. When I was on, I was still on a hundred percent. And that was one of the frightening things about invisible injuries. But I was on till 10.30, finished the lesson, nailed it with my 10 students, got into the car to drive home. And sometime later, I don't remember, but I was pulled over by four police cars. And apparently in my drive home, I had run four red lights. And then the first cop had followed me. I'd ignored him. So he had called back up. He figured we have a problem here, a second cop. And eventually, as I was turning onto my little side street in suburbia, four cop cars are there. And that's when I finally realized, uh, oh, there's a problem here. And the cop came over, rode down the window and said, buddy, are you brain damaged or what? And that's when I had to concede that maybe I was. Um, and that was the last day I taught. <laughs> so it, it was a process of denial, denial, denial until eventually I had no choice but to accept that something profound had happened and life was going to have to change. Right. And I think that that, that Black Knight story is uh, – people can definitely relate to that. When they're trying to do something, whether it's creative or not, they reach obstacles and they, they find that maybe their talent isn't there or their ability isn't there or just their patience isn't there. And it's like they keep fighting against it and they keep trying and trying and trying. And sometimes it's so hard to find that – uh, stopping point where it's like, okay, maybe this thing isn't for me and maybe I need to do something different uh, or, uh, you know, is it just a matter of pounding through? So for you, what was it that obviously <laughs> you had a very unique situation and like you literally kind of drove yourself to the ground in a way? Oh, yeah, pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. Until you got to the, to that point. Um, so what what did it look like after that? When did you – obviously, this was a good reset point for you uh, where you realized you needed to do something different or you, life needed to change in some way. No more teaching. Uh, what did the journey look like from that point on? Well, that was – that was I was going to say the darkest, but that was the second darkest sort of moment in the journey. So stay tuned, folks. Darker stuff is still to come, but uh, – <laughs> Sorry, but but good point for a, this would be a good point for a commercial break. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Yeah, stay tuned. Yeah. What will happen to our hero next? Anyway, um, <laughs> again, spending way too much of my life in Greek epic. I'm um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, e essentially, I think what happened is um, yes, the the moment with the cops kind of that kind of police and cruisers have a way of sort of putting everything into a very binary perspective, but. The interesting thing is, I mean, I, I, I was a wonderful wife, happily married, and she had been raising the alarm bells about what I about me trying to sustain this teaching job for most of that year. Um, and uh, of course, I hadn't been listening. It's it's really interesting. I think an awful lot of creative people or high achievers get too much or so much of their self concept tied up in the work that they in the work that they do, or, and I'll put this in the first person, I had so much tied up in the work that I was doing. I was passionate about teaching that the concept of leaving it was, was so daunting and so primal that what you start doing is you start paring away at everything else first. So uh, the truth of the matter was, uh, before I reached the stage of quitting, um, and realizing I have to walk away, 
I had become just this person who lived to teach. Mm. So every other ball that a human being has to juggle in their life, like your marriage ball, your parenting ball, I had two teenage sons, um, uh, your social life ball, your physical fitness ball, you drop all of those so that you can keep that one professional ball that's how you self-identify in the air as long as possible. So when I finally accepted that I couldn't be a classroom teacher, it was pretty, pretty bad because by that time I'd really, really strained every other part of my life to the breaking point. And um, that's when I started to think about, well, what am I going to do now? And I remember sort of sitting sitting down with one of the vocational counselors uh, that I was lucky. I My employer was a high school and up here in Canada, we have these wonderful things called teachers unions. So we are paid ridiculously and healthily well as professionals. And so there was all kinds of support and available for me that I was grateful for, but I wasn't really grateful for it at the time because I was in trauma. But when I sat down with vocational counselors, uh, their question was, so what do you want to do, Jeff? Uh, what are you going to do now? And that's where it was scary because I'd spent the previous 20 years identifying as a teacher. So well, I don't know uh, what do people do when suddenly their vocation is pulled out from under the rug. It's not as though I said, oh, well, I've always wanted to play violin, so I'll start that. <laughs> you know, I, I think those kind of things are silly. All I wanted to do was keep doing what I was always doing. And uh, I remember the vocational counselor, the first poor gentleman, he was new at the job and he tried to be helpful. He said, well, why don't you just go into the classroom? I've been watching you teach and uh, just teach with less energy and passion and maybe we can make this work. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, and I kind of said, well, wh what would that look like? And he said, well, you're pretty energetic. You bounce around the room. You're telling stories. You're doing simulation games. He said, uh, you're teaching history. Aren't there some really good documentaries? And, uh, you know, there were oh worksheets. And, and I'm sure that anybody that's listening to this now who does anything creative and is passionate about it knows how I was feeling. It was like, you know, kill me now. Uh, sure, sure. Absolutely. Uh, it was, it was, I think that was, that was a really down moment when the employer's proposal for what to do with me was to teach me how to do my passion at a mediocre and half-assed level so I could sustain it for longer periods of time during the working day. And it, I, I'm, the employer was doing what they have to do. They they legally had to find some form of employment that I could do that was commensurate with my pay grid and all of those things. And so um, this was the best they could come up with. And it, it makes sense. I mean, like, oh. it, it makes sense. But I, I laugh because it's just like, yeah, like as a creative person, it's like you can't oh. you can't hold back. Like, what, what's the point of of doing the thing that you're most passionate about if you can't insert that passion fully, you know? And that was, I, I think that was likely that I remember coming home that day and um, my wife tells me she had never heard me drop so many F-bombs in a five minute period <laughs> in my life. Um, I, I was just, I was beside myself. And so she wrote an email back to the employer because it was likely best that I didn't go anywhere near putting anything on paper in my current mental state. And, oh, that's a pro tip to any people who are listening. If if you find yourself in this state and you're listening to this and this is your life story, get somebody who's not you to do the emails and the phone calls. <laughs> like, right. I, it, it's just a little bit of an aside. But the thing that saved me was my wife stepped in and became an instant buffer between me and my rage and my hurt and my pain when it was dealing with all of the bureaucracy that you have to deal with whenever you have an injury. And I've met so many people in the meantime who have decided to go it alone and pick up the phone and call the workplace or call the insurance board. And they've already got problems. And then they just vent and blow up on these poor bureaucrats. And they dig themselves into such incredibly deep holes that then they don't, everybody's their enemy instead of their helpful friend. And sorry, that's a bit of a sidebar. And it's just, it's been my experience that when you're in one of these dark places, uh, find an advocate who isn't in that place to do your talking for you. But yeah, um, does that make sense? I don't know. You've interviewed far more people than I have. <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah, you need to take like your either get somebody else to do it or 
sleep on it and see if <laughs> see if you want to word it the same way the next day. You know, oh, like just stay, oh, sleep ne- on it. <laughs> oh, never, ever, never, ever send a, a an email or tweet or I mean, if we haven't figured this out by now, we never will. But but I found that I couldn't even get onto the phone in the first couple of years post injury with all the bureaucracy and the insurance, which necessarily runs molasses slow and is full of overworked bureaucrats on the other end of the phone without me risking losing my temper and frustration. And mm-hmm. my mom used to say, you catch way more flies with honey than vinegar. And, uh, my wife actually posted that as a poster above my office door for two years post injury. And I'd keep staring at it before I get onto the phone with anybody and try to remember to use honey instead of vinegar. But, mm-hmm. but when I got back to, um, uh, the workplace people, um, I, the workplace guy, when I said, no, I can't, I, I can't just teach less energetically. That's not going to work. Uh, with a poor employer said, well, have you got an idea? What could you do? And I asked then for a week uh, because I really only had about an hour of cognitive use a day before the brain was gone. But I said, give me a week. I'll see if I can come up with a plan that meets, send me a list of what you need as your legal requirements and give me a week. And that was young man. That was a week of insane hell because I, I I was trying to create a master plan that my employer would approve and allow me to continue doing, which would allow me to keep teaching, but which would work inside of my, the fact that I couldn't go for many hours without getting into trouble. So a week of insane insanity ensued and I'd write out my frantic drafts and then my wife would stay up and try to take my concussed chicken scratch and turn it into English prose. And a week later we sent it off And I essentially sent the employer a plane which said, look, why don't you let me be a guest speaker inside of other teachers' classes? And I'll be able to do what I do well, which is go in and deliver a lecture or a story, but I won't be responsible. I won't be the teacher of record. I won't have to deal with marking the papers or attendance or supervision. And I'll do one a week. And if I can pull it off and if I can make it work, then if I get stronger and healthier with time, I'll do two a week. But the beauty is if something goes wrong with my brain and I can't do it, I won't be leaving the system high and dry because, well, there is a teacher already in the classroom and scheduled. But if I can do it, I'll be basically giving the teacher some area of expertise that I can do. And lo and behold, my wonderful employer said, go for it. And that's sort of where I started on the journey I am today. So I spent the next few years becoming a sort of traveling guest lecturer, storyteller inside of classrooms. And uh, I did everything. I mean, for about five years, I I did, you know, the I had a lecture on the history of rock and roll. I had a lecture on the causes of World War I. I had a lecture on basic problems and philosophy. And then in the whole midst of sort of offerings I had, I had this story I did where I went in and I told English students, Homer's Iliad and Homer's Odyssey. And uh, wouldn't you know, that was the one that ended up from all the others eventually kind of sticking. Right. And what was it about them that, that made it stick? Was it just the, the vast amount of content? (laughs) Like the fact that they're, um, well, I think both uh, the Trojan War podcast and um, the Odyssey end up being 25 hours a piece pretty much. Yes. (laughs) Yep. Now, was that the reason? Um, I got lucky um, when I was a first year high school teacher, there was, and had no clue what I was doing and never even heard these stories. I got thrown into an English class and told you're teaching the core curriculum. It involves Greek myth. You have to do Iliad and you have to do Odyssey. And I didn't know them, but there was some guy in the school way older than me that had found a way to tell them as stories. And so he'd go into his English class and he'd do an hour a day for six days. So he had the he had the Trojan War and the Iliad boiled down to a six hour story. He had the Odyssey boiled down to a six hour story. And I remember in the first year that I was teaching English, I'd take my prep period and rush into his class and sit with his grade nine students in the back of the room and listen and frantically take notes and then go in the next period and try to fake it from the notes. And <laughs> um, I got better at it with time. And eventually I started to make it my own. But I think the thing about the two stories is that, well, they're, they're humanity's original Game of Thrones. I mean, 
they're, they're kick-ass stories. They've got geopolitics, they've got action, they've got adventure. They have human drama and characters that you can actually buy into and really live and die with during the course of the story. Uh, they have that element of sort of the magic realism um, in Game of Thrones. You know, you've got dragons and things like that flying around and and white witches and things like that. And in, in, in Homer's Iliad, you have the Olympian gods up there manipulating the plot and the events. So the stories have everything to just be highly, highly, highly entertaining. And what I would do when I started making my offerings uh, with this school board plan is uh, one of the offerings I do is I'd go into grade nine English classes and I would go in and I'd say to the teacher, well, I'll tell you what, I'll come in once for an hour a day for a week and I'll tell the kids the Trojan War epic, or I'll come in for an hour a week and I'll tell the kids the Odyssey. And that is kind of where I started off on where I ultimately am today is sitting in front of 25 grade nine kids in a classroom on a Tuesday morning, telling them a story at the front of the room and learning what parts of the story worked, learning how to deliver it, which parts were confusing, uh, all of those kind of things. That It all happened there, but it wasn't, and I want to emphasize, it's not, it wasn't as though I had this master plan in the years post-injury that, oh, I know what I will do. I will become a storyteller of Greek epic. I could have easily become a storyteller of the history of rock and roll or of World War I. It's just that it turned out the Greek epic was the one that stuck. And it's the one where teachers then at the end of the week would email me and say, hey, I heard you had a great time with the class last week. My kids want to hear it too. They heard about this. Are you free? And so it just turned out to be the one young man that stuck. So it was the one that I started to polish and develop and spend more and more time. And likely within five years of this new plane with the school board, I wasn't doing the history of rock and roll. I wasn't doing problems in philosophy or World War I because my dance card was completely full of going from classroom to freaking classroom telling Greek epic. And, and um, so I think the reason that matters is because I think a lot of folks, when they confront an injury, assume that the road forward and what things are going to look like are all clear and laid out and everything is going to work into place and, well, I'll get myself a plan. And a lot of the time it just develops organically and accidentally. And then you look back afterwards and go, oh, now I see the causal links that led to where I am today. But does that make sense? Total sense. And and it's kind of a theme of, of the podcast is uh, you, uh, whatever your kind of creative endeavor that you want to set forth on, uh, you have this plan in your mind, uh, or you have these things that you think will stick. This is going to be my kind of thesis. And uh, so often when you look back, you know, two, three, five, ten 10 years later, you see that you went a completely different direction than you initially thought you would go down. But you need to to start. You need to start somewhere and you need to have that audience and that feedback and see what sticks. And when you see that you're getting that feedback, that oh, my classroom wants to, to hear the, the uh, yeah. this Greek epic, um, you say, okay. And then the evidence is right there. Like this is, okay, this is what is sticking. This is what people are resonating with. Um, and let me just double down. Let me quadruple down into this one thing and really um, polish that into kind of my new thesis, my new journey. Yeah. And, and it's a great way of doing it. Um, yeah. The idea of the, yeah, the one thesis and the antithesis leading. Yeah. Yeah. You got a background in philosophy, man. That's sweet. But, uh, <laughs> but the really neat thing about this is that I was kind of building on the strengths I already had. Uh, I knew how to step into a classroom already. I've been doing that for 20 years. So, you know, all the classroom management stuff, which would have baffled somebody who had never been in a classroom. Uh, that wasn't an issue for me. I knew what to do with 25 teenagers on a Tuesday afternoon. So uh, one of the other things I find is that it really helps when you're required to some life event, in this case, a concussion, but it, there are all kinds of things that people have that, you know, throw your life off of its nice intended tracks. But when it happens, if you can build on something that you know you already do well and you you care about doing well and you're passionate about that, then at least you have a few aces in your hands as you sort of start on the parts that are going to be new and difficult for you. I had to learn how to manage my time. I had to learn how to deal with the headaches, but I knew how to step into a classroom 
And I already knew how to tell this story. So then the new journey was, okay, how do I go from being a classroom teacher to being a itinerant performance classroom storyteller? But it was something that I, I could graft onto what I already knew and could do well and find ways of doing it. So I, I think the next stage for me was uh, eventually the classes, it got to the point, young men, where I was, I was stuck because I was getting invitations to go into every English class in the school. And some of the, some of the schools we have up here, what it would mean is I couldn't sustain it. I could still only do one hour and 10 minute long show a day. That's all that my brain would handle. And I needed to then go sleep. So the day came when the next step in this journey towards I am today was when I proposed, instead of going into a whole bunch of separate English classes, I said, why don't we bring a whole bunch of English classes down to the auditorium and I'll stand on the stage and instead of telling to 30 students, I'll tell to uh, 120 students. And that way I can actually get to every kid inside of the school without burning myself out. And uh, I hadn't realized at the time, I was just doing it to try to save myself the trouble of having to say no to a lot of classes. I just thought I'll just warehouse them all together. But looking back on it now, suddenly that was the next stage in the journey. I was now telling the story, but instead of being in a classroom, where you're a meter and a half or two meters from the kids, I was now up in a stage and they were in the auditorium. And that meant that I needed to have a microphone. Uh, I couldn't use the old classroom teacher tech trick of uh, proximity control, you know, where Johnny's on a cell phone and you keep talking, but you walk and you stand beside Johnny while you're telling your story and he puts his cell phone <laughs> away because suddenly the kid in his cell phone was not accessible to me. And there was a space between the auditorium and the stage. And I had to learn a whole new series of techniques just to survive that first show. But that was sort of phase two, which was bringing the show onto the big stage into the auditorium or into the theater. And did that change the way you told the actual story? I mean, I know it's like one thing about like projection and like you said, uh, proximity, but did that change the way that you, that the story kind of came out of you? Yes. <laughs> one of the problems that I I encountered really, really quickly is that th there was a distance there. When you're on a stage, you're a performer and you try to break that down and create as much intimacy as you can. But intimacy was one of the things which I was really, really used to inside of the classroom. I would, I would walk up and down the rows telling the story. And I could take digressions all the time. Or if there was something I wanted to explain, I could run over to the blackboard and say, okay, uh, let me just show you how a Greek stage would operate. And so I could switch from storytelling mode into teacher mode really, really quickly and do all of those things. Well, suddenly on stage, I felt really, really handicapped. I, I didn't have a lectern. <laughs> I didn't have my whiteboard. Um, I couldn't I couldn't uh, get close to a kid that 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 needed some additional sort of physical support or anything. So the story changed and became less a lecture and more a performance. And as soon as it went from lecture to performance, it meant I had to change pacing. I had to take the parts out of the story where I realized it was dragging. And there's nothing like 200 sort of high school students sitting in an auditorium to give you instant feedback on what parts of your story and your performance <laughs> are dragging. Um, mm -hmm. The thing that makes teenagers such a brilliant audience to sort of cut your chops on is that teenagers, I love them, I adore them, but they wear their hearts on their sleeve. And if they're bored, they haven't learned any of the control mechanisms to fake that they're interested. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know about, I know cities around the country and around North America are different. When I perform in different places, adult audiences are quite different. But when I get on stage in a professional venue in Ottawa, Canada, where I live, the truth of the matter is Ottawa people, and I know it's a stereotype about Canadians, but Ottawa people are so freaking positive and nice and generous that you can get up on stage and you can suck. You can truly put on an hour worth of first class boring shit. <laughs> and an Ottawa audience will leap to its feet at the end of the show in a standing ovation because we're nice and that's just what we do. Mm -hmm. And the problem is if you're learning your chops in front of that sort of an audience, hey, it's really good for the affirmation. Like you need that sometimes, but you're not getting any feedback. 
Whereas a teenage audience, if you know, if they're having fun, they laugh, they cry, they cheer, and they come up to you in the break and they want your freaking autograph, which is really kind of comical. But <laughs> if you're boring and if you're dull and if you've gone off down some rabbit hole digression that they're not interested in, well, the cell phones come out, they start talking to each other, they get fidgety, and um, you know right away, oh, the next time I do this show, I got to make some changes. Um, I videotaped my first five years of high school performances in auditoriums and then forced myself to go back home afterwards and watch the videotape footage in spite of the fact that watching it sometimes was cringeworthy because that's what I used to go, oh, that joke is hitting, this line is hitting, oh, watch over here, now they're crying when I'm killing the dog kind of thing. Oh, this part, they're really bored. And I could hear audience rumbles. And um, so that was sort of um, phase two of the journey was turning what I had done all my life into something the same, but totally different. Right. Well, and so as you're doing that, um, you mentioned before um, with your parents and uh, then kind of instilling in you like these uh, like unrelenting standards. <laughs> um, so when you do something like that, when you sit and force yourself to watch a tape, is that a um, kind of a dangerous path for you to go down? Like how do you navigate the um, that kind of murky water of, of uh, understanding something that needs to be changed uh, as opposed to something that you're just being a perfectionist about? Okay. Yeah, it's – okay, that's – that's a bang on question because that gets at the at the nub I think of for me the creative problem. Um, I, I'm going to answer your question. It's just the way to answer the question is in mythology all over the world, um, Greek myth, but every myth, there's recurring stories of learning the names of monsters or demons. And once you learn the secret name of a monster or a demon or something like that, in mythologies all over the world, once you learn that monster's secret name, then you have power and control over that monster. And, uh, you know, the folktale Rumpelstiltskin, where eventually they figure out that they, the bad guy's name is Rumpelstiltskin. And as soon as you learn his name, then he doesn't have any power anymore. But that sort of fairy tale happens everywhere. And I think for for me... Uh, the trick was recognizing that one of my demons that I need to name is that I have these unfamiliar or these unrelenting standards and um, learning that as soon as I produce something, as soon as I, even today, when I record an episode of a podcast or when I was watching those videos of my performances, I had to recognize that my demon is that whatever I produce, my first response to it is going to be, it's shit. It's not good enough. You suck. Why are you mm -hmm. even trying to do this? And that's, that's the childhood of unrelenting standards. So learning how to do that once I was doing this new performance stuff was not only the technique of getting better. So it wasn't all as much shit because there were some pretty bad shows in the early years, but the real trick was learning how to get familiar with, oh, Jeff's doing his self-talk thing that he does again. Uh, Jeff's doing that thing that Jeff does when he's tired and the headaches are bad and he's listening to his draft of his podcast and he's gone to that place where he sits and he yells at himself and he says, you're like, if you could, young man, if you could listen to some of the stuff that I cut out of Trojan War, the podcast and Odyssey, the podcast, when I'm doing a recording session and it's going south and I know even as I'm telling this story that it's not coming out properly. And I'll be halfway through a sentence. I'll be saying, and then Odysseus stepped into his great hall, approached his wife and oh fucking damn, you're such a useless piece of, why are you doing this garbage, Jeff? You suck. And then the <laughs> headphones will go across the room. And yep. I cut that stuff out of the final product, <laughs> but a full confession, it happens because of the unrelenting standards thing. And the only thing that saves me is, I've learned that the unrelenting standards is my demon and I've learned its name and the name is unrelenting standards. Mm -hmm. So then it's walking away, you know, taking a break for me, doing something cardiovascular and not cognitive, uh, getting out there, like stepping away completely for half an hour. And if it's winter in Ottawa, it might mean walking up and down the stairs for 15 minutes just to get the brain and the body doing something else. 
and then coming back and naming the demon of the unrelenting standards and so on, and and basically having a little talk with myself and saying, oh, so Jeff, you're doing that Jeff thing that you do. And then have the other Jeff in the room say, so Jeff, do you think that Jeff is going to learn this time not to do that? And eventually end up sounding like sort of the color commentator in the sportscaster talking about a play-by-play, only I'm playing all three roles. And I talk myself back down to, oh, this is just part of the process. Uh, my unrelenting standard demon is coming and I know him. I'm used to him. I got to deal with him. He won't go away, but I know who he is. I know his name, which means I have power over him. And then back to the podcasting. So that's how I do it now. That's what I had to learn when the stakes were higher, when I started to get onto larger stages to larger audiences, because as the stakes got higher, my unrelenting standards demon manifest himself more frequently, if that makes sense. (laughs) Uh, it definitely makes sense, and that's sound advice, of course, to to just get away from it, but uh, or to, to just take a break f- from it and get the body moving and just <laughs> take your mind elsewhere. But also naming it, um, and uh, it's great advice for anybody to just not only name what the problem is, to to write it down or to say it out loud. Say, I'm dealing with whatever procrastination or perfectionism or laziness or any of the <laughs> any of the many many demons or monsters that we face in our creative journeys um, but then to I, I love that idea of having that co- kind of color commentary about talking about it because it makes it a little bit less scary and a little bit less um, insurmountable uh, when you can kind of talk it down and say like, add a commentary it's not just in your brain it's just not it's not just something that you're dealing with in your own head that you can't um, kind of quantify but you can just talk about it and and kind of talk yourself down and then just get through it yeah one of the one of the that idea of it in your head one one of the hardest parts um in sort of phase two of my life which was learning how to come to terms with this new concussion was um the the problem with a, a concussion or a, a brain injury is it it falls into that category of invisible injuries. Mm-hmm. And one of the demons that I don't deal with now because um, I've got over that phase of my life, but I'd say that the demon that occupied me for the first few years was uh, the whole trying to use my brain to figure out what was wrong with my injured brain. Mm, yeah no yeah it makes sense (laughs) oh i I mean i I remember um i i i went and and spent a lot of time working with a professional psychoneurologist and uh, just a little sidebar plug uh man maybe your listeners are brighter or stronger or more self-sufficient than i am but eventually i had to drag myself off and and accept that i needed the help of a professional counselor to help me figure all of this scary shit out. Um, I would never have been able to name my unrelenting standards demon without a paid professional working with me to help me name it. It's not Mm -hmm. a realization I woke up with on a Tuesday morning on my own. I needed a tour guide uh, sort of to help me get through hell. Uh, And I I think an awful lot of people are afraid to go down that direction because they see it as a sign of defeat. Oh, you know, well, I'm strong enough to do this on my own. Uh, I I don't think anybody is. I certainly wasn't. Uh, it was a paid professional who I credit with doing an awful lot of the help in those early years of helping me figure it out. But but I remember sitting down with her one day, and and I, I won't use her name just in case she's still out there listening, but I, I remember saying to her something like, uh, you know, uh, Dr. G, uh, I, I, I've got this concussion. Uh, is it all in my head? Is it a brain injury or is it a problem with my mind? And she said, both. And it was trying to parse out the two parts of the injury. Um, one of the self-doubts that I faced, which was debilitating for the first few years, was I wasn't really always convinced, do I really have a brain injury or not? Because when my brain injury was on, I knew I had it. But when I was working at 100%, it didn't feel like there was anything wrong with my brain at all. And it could get into your head a little bit. Um, and then, of course, the thing you were using to try to figure it out was the damaged uh, part of your noggin. So it's it's a little bit of a problem. I, I know people that deal with depression and, and other forms of invisible injury struggle with this all the time is how do you 
figure out what's wrong with you when the tool you're using to do it is the tool which is likely the source of the damage in the first place. But <laughs> um, it, it was right. um, it took me a long time to sort of get through that. For the first couple of years, what I really, really wanted to do more than anything was wrap a, a bandage around my forehead and put some blood on it and walk with a limp so that when I walked into a room at work, people would go, oh, there's Jeff. Look, he has a legitimate injury. The poor man, he is suffering. So instead of worrying all the time that people were looking at me and wondering what sort of fake job I was getting away with that let me leave the classroom after an hour of teaching every day. Right. That was hard. That was really, really hard. Uh, I have a lot of empathy for people that struggle with that sort of thing because I spent a lot of time in the first few years worrying that people were watching me and suspecting that I had some ulterior motive for maintaining my concussion symptoms, uh, <laughs> if that makes any mm. sense. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's one of the most frustrating things, I think, for people that have uh, invisible injuries. The fact that nobody could know, you know what I mean? It's not like a broken leg where everybody gives you sympathy or anything like that. It's it's something that you are battling yourself and nobody knows the intensity of the battle, you know? Yeah, I spent – in the early years, I spent a lot of time um, – I think it's because of my control personality and being the high achiever type wanting to, when people would meet me wanting to justify why I wasn't working full time and then tell them my story. Um, and I realized what I was, I mean, looking back on it now, it was because I felt so uncomfortable. Uh, I was a 41 year old man. I, I was physically still really fit I was healthy and I would kind of show up for work in the morning when I was teaching one class and I'd go into the classroom and I'd knock a home run out of the park. I mean, I was a really good lecturer and speaker and I had an hour and then I'd pack up and head home and I didn't want to, um, I, I didn't want to be theatrical about the entire thing. So when, when I go into the classroom, I, I, I disguised any headache pain I might have. And when I talked to colleagues, I, and they'd say, how are you doing? Well, you know, nobody wants Debbie Downer. So I'd say, oh, great. How are you doing? Wonderful day. And, you know, people don't want you telling your pain story every day of their life. But what ended up happening, of course, is then that I had, I remember one day when a colleague kind of, who didn't know me that well, but had seen me teaching as I was packing up and heading for my car at 10, 15 in the morning, having put in my full work day, he turned around and he winked and he said, so, so off to the golf course, buddy, uh, I'm going to have to get myself your injury. Pretty sweet life you've got set up. Mm. And yeah, that was okay. I think, you know, I told you at the start of this interview that that was like the second, mo I told you the second worst moment of hell mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that set me back six months. That one comment. Yeah, because now the comment wouldn't have set me back if it wasn't my already self-talk that everybody was likely watching and listening. And the only difference between this guy and everybody else, this guy was a dick and everybody else was <laughs> keeping their secret views to themselves. Right. But that's what I just assumed. I thought, oh, so he's the only guy who's basically pointing and saying the emperor has no clothes. Everybody else is feeling it. And my response for the next year and a half was anytime anybody approached me, even a stranger in the grocery store at two o'clock in the afternoon or whatever. And they'd say, so uh, uh, what are you up to uh, playing hooky today? Uh, Cause you know, I was 41 and I look like you should be at work or something. I would turn around and I'd say, well, no. And here's what you need to know. And I would give them a 15 minute detailed story about the nature of the injury, how it wasn't my fault, the 15 different physiotherapies I'd gone to, all the professionals I was working with, and how this was not really any fun at all, but part of my rehab program. And I'd just go on and on and on trying to justify because I was convinced that I was being judged. And it took a long, long, long time to realize that most people are so wrapped up and so engaged in their own lives that they're not really spending a lot of time busy dissecting other people's lives. <laughs> Right. Um, it was humbling to realize that I, that I was the center of my own universe during those years, but I certainly wasn't the center of most people's and that this guy had not been the universal chorus. He had just been, you know, a dick. It, it's one of the hardest things to, to get over as creative people, especially when you're putting yourself out there. Um, 
is that negative comment, that one negative comment that just infiltrates. It's just that one seed that just keeps growing and growing and growing and, and <laughs> no, no amount of positive comments or supportive comments can kind of oh. help to pluck that, that weed out. <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> true can oh, shit I, I i got i have itunes podcast reviews for trojan war the podcast of course you know mm-hmm. and i still and this is my unrelenting standards demon but still to this day you know about once a month i'll go in and i have this little app that'll send me all the new reviews for the month right and i've been pretty blessed uh the comments i've got about 160 or 70 reviews uh of the podcast and I'm really grateful for it. And most of them are really, really nice. And I mean, you and I both know that it's a, there's a bit of a statistical thing there, which is that if people are, are voluntarily listening to a free product like your podcast and my podcast, they really have to be hostile to take the trouble to write a negative review. Right, right. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, so we both know that statistically speaking, we're, we are skewed towards people that liked our free product enough that they were willing to write something nice. But I have in my list of about 100 and some reviews, there's still four of them that I can pretty well quote word from word to you today. And of course, there are the four people that gave me a one out of five iTunes review. Mm-hmm. And isn't it a really strange thing that I can't quote from memory any of the 150 people that gave me a five out of five and wrote a nice paragraph, but I could tell you precisely what was wrong from the four people who said that my podcast was shit. And um, I think that's the nature of, I don't know if it's the nature of everybody. I know for me, that's another one of those demons that I'm very familiar with and uh, I can name, but I would be lying if I told you that uh, the negative reviews aren't devastating because the negative reviews, I don't know what it is about them, but they tend to they tend to be the things that you focus in on. I don't understand that process. I just know that it's not on my journey as a creative person. It's not something that I can turn around and offer you or your listeners any advice on. I haven't got around it. I still overly value the negative reviews and dismiss the positive reviews as just another nice review. Right. I think, uh, so there's a, there's a couple strategies. One that I employ, and I wrote about this recently, is just trying to just give it the middle finger. <laughs> just read it, give it the middle finger, and put the middle finger down and then move on with your life. And the middle finger isn't this like, uh, oh, screw you, man. It's just like this, yeah. okay, I'm ignoring you, like that kind of a middle finger, and then just moving on. The tricky part is, though, words of encouragement for anybody that that do receive that one or two random negative comments or, or just snarky shut up comments, <laughs> you know what I mean, is the fact yeah. that they're rare, and that's why you notice them. Um, and like you, ha- you don't have enough negative comments – given to you to sort of build up a tolerance for it yet. So in the early days, when you do get those (laughs) negative comments, it's like almost like a compliment. It's like, okay, like, I don't really know how to deal with this that much because I don't get it that often. And that's like kind of a good thing. Um, So uh, until you can build up that tolerance, until you get enough of them that you're sort of used to it and you know how to move on, just use that as kind of words of encouragement, you know, it's a rare thing, you know. Yeah, it's my my mother was a great cook and she used to make home uh she used to make lemon meringue pie and she used to deliberately because she made her lemon meringue pie from scratch as opposed to using some fancy pie filling you could buy. Oh no, mom boiled down the lemons or whatever you do to make lemon meringue pie filling, but my mom would always deliberately leave about 3 lemon seeds inside of her pie even when she'd serve it to the finest of company. And it's not because she let them go by by accident. My mum wanted those lemon seeds there because she said they were the control group that let the people eating her pie recognize that it had been made from scratch <laughs> because it had that little flaw still in it quite deliberately. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you listen to a person, my story, my mum like that, and you begin to understand a person like me. I mean, <laughs> right. to, the, the tactical genius of putting, you know, lemon seeds into your pie filling so that people would recognize that it was a brilliant homemade pie pie filling, that requires a a really interesting personality type. (laughs) 
I didn't realize it at the time, but (laughs) yeah. So yeah. So the sort of the final stage of the journey after kind of getting back to the large plot is once I learned how to do the story on stage and perform for student audiences, the, the, the next big step for me was learning how to perform for adult audiences. And it's one thing as a high school teacher. I mean, high school teachers, and we all remember our high school teachers who had the stage, dominated the stage, and should have been taken off it and would have been by anybody except a a forced audience like teenagers. But the day came when I thought, if I'm going to be a storyteller, and if this is going to be my new career, uh, the schools are paying me to go from school to school and do my shows. But what would happen if I tried telling these stories to adults? And I had an incredible fear that, oh, I knew how to tell the teenagers and teenagers were great about it. But what would happen if I actually had to tell it to adults? And that was the next big risk hurdle for me was um, going, okay, can this be done for a different type of demographic who uh, aren't been brought down to an auditorium and told to sit still and behave by, you know, by their custodians. And that was really scary. Uh, and I had to go way back to the beginning for that. Um, I think when you're on the sort of a creative journey, it's one step forward and a step back, and then maybe two steps forward and a step back. So my wife finally, after I've been telling on stage to, by then I was telling, you know, to three or 400 kids at a time on stage. And my shows were like three or four hours long over two days. So I was getting really accomplished at that audience, but it was still the scariest thing ever. My wife dragged me out one night to this, uh, open mic story swap that there was this club in Ottawa of storytellers. And she said, why don't you come and perform, you know, one of your 20 minute Greek epic stories for this audience? And I thought like open mic adults, uh, no. And she said, well, then just come and listen to other people's stories and, you know, uh, see what it feels like. And she was smart because that way I didn't have to commit to getting up on stage. And I, I went and I watched these adults for an hour and an hour and a half getting up and telling their 15 minute stories. And at the break, I kind of thought, you know, um, I think I can do this. And it took all of my nerve, but I went up to the uh, convener and said, I've got a story. I'm a new teller, but could I, uh, have you got a 15 minute slot after the break? And uh, I got posted and I went up and I just told well, you know the story. It's the episode number one of Trojan Where the podcast. It's the the wedding up on Mount Olympus. And mm-hmm. it's a stock piece story that I've been telling to teenagers for years. And likely the scariest moment was getting up in front of a mic with 25 adults in a little bar and telling that story to adults. And uh, I didn't know how it would go over. It was, that was a huge leap into sort of leap into the dark for me. And it went over remarkably well, much to my surprise. And that was my first step into telling to adult audiences. And then from there, it was larger adult audiences. And then it was paying adult audiences and all of that kind of thing. As you're talking to adults, then was it a different, like we talked about, you know, the step of going from a small classroom to an auditorium, and then how your storytelling changed. Uh, and then was it different than when you had a, an adult audience? Did the, the story change itself then too? Yes. Uh, one wonderful way the story could change is, hey, this is Greek epic, which means that it is full of the most adult and kinky sex content right. ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I abs- I never, ever, ever told the story of Leda and the Swan to a high school audience because I just what I all of my instincts and triggers told me that you know Zeus manifesting himself as a white as a giant white trumpeter swan and raping a fourteen year old girl who then gives birth to a giant egg who turns into Helen of Troy, great story but maybe not in the high school classroom. Um, oh my gosh, that's a story that's great to tell inside of a bar. Uh, <laughs> Right, absolutely. Uh, particularly if you're going late in the evening. Uh, so, uh, have you ever had a really weird day where you woke up in the morning and you've been raped by a swan? Well, let me. You know, yeah. It's it's so suddenly with adults, um, the content license was gone. Uh, I was now free to tell Greek epic the way that it was likely told back in the Bronze Age and before it got sanitized inside of our classrooms and our universities. So every twisted little fun kinky story um, I exploited to maximum advantage because why not? And that's the kind of thing I can do in the podcast because it's 
it's for an adult or at least a mature audience. On stage, adults, uh, the hardest thing actually, and this is kind of a little bit, you never know what's going to be weird. The hardest thing was getting used to the lights. Mm. Um, the first time I stepped onto a stage in a club where I'd been given 30 minutes to get up and tell a 30 minute Greek epic story. Uh, it was kind of a curated night. There were four different new tellers being featured and I was all excited about this. And so I got up and I always wear when I perform, if I have a choice, uh, a wireless headset mic so I can bop around the stage like Britney Spears, right? <laughs> um, like I, I, I'm a sure. little bit animated and sitting in front of a mic is, is hard for me to sit still hardest thing learning podcasting. I used to drop out all the time, but, but I got up, I suddenly got called. I was the third guy on, there were about maybe 150 people in the audience. And so Jeff will be telling us, uh, you know, the story of the Cyclops's cave or whatever. I can't even remember the story, hopped onto the stage and suddenly the stage lights came on and I couldn't see a freaking person in front of me. It was like, you know, deer in headlights. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I had got used to gearing my entire response because I was a classroom teacher to looking into my audience's eyes, watching their body language, because that's what high school classroom teachers, that's our stock and trade. You know, you, you pick up on all the, the non-verbal cues and you can tell if your audience is having fun by their facial response. Well, suddenly there I had this 30 minute story, which was supposed to you know be funny and then sad and then funny. I couldn't see a single soul in the room. The lights were just glaring into my eyes. And uh, young man, I froze. That was one of those nights when I kind of stood there and I made, you know, that classic storytelling performing error of not just diving ahead boldly and faking it till you make it. I, I remember standing there and uh, apologizing and then halfway through checking uh, because I couldn't tell and so immediately, and this goes back to good old Jeff um, and my unrelenting standards, I assumed that my audience was bored because they were quiet. Um, turned out I was telling a very quiet, serious section of the story, but I didn't have the feedback to know or to trust. Um, so that was a disaster. I remember going home that night and saying, I, I, I can't ever perform in front of lights again. And my, my dear wife saying, well, you know, Jeff, if you're going to be telling stories to adults, you're going to be performing in auditoriums and on stages and they dim the lights. You're going to have to get used to it. And the next year when I rehearsed my live shows and I would rehearse my live shows to the point where I knew them, I didn't have to tell a script. I could go off script and everything like that. But what I had to do, and my wife was the expert on it, is she brought me down into our dark basement and the rehearsals were always before she'd leave for work in the morning. So we'd be sitting there at 6.30 in the morning. I'd make her her breakfast and her coffee. And then I'd get up to do my hour set that I was practicing. And she got these huge like Klieg lights. <laughs> and so she'd sit at one end of the basement. And then right before I'd start, she'd pretend she was the audience and she'd say, and now our next teller, Jeff Wright. And she'd clap and everything like that. And then she'd turn on the switch and suddenly it was like I was in an interrogation room with these lights staring at me. I couldn't see a thing. And I had to learn how to tell the story and trust that even though I couldn't see my audience, they were there. And <laughs> um, that took a long time. I still, if I have my way and it's my house and my auditorium and my show, I still confess I will sneak in and get them to turn up the house lights enough that I can at least see the first six or seven rows and see the audiences. I, I, I still prefer it. But these are the kind of things that, you, you know, you don't figure out till uh, you experiment with something and go, oh, that's not working very well. And then it's back to the drawing board. And oh, I have to learn this new particular little skill to make it work. And kind of the final stage in the journey was when I decided to podcast these stories. And the technical trick there, of course, was now, not only could I not see the audience who was sitting in front of me, I couldn't hear them either because the audience isn't freaking there. So now when I sit in front of a mic telling these stories, I'm having to close my eyes and pretend that there's a house and pretend that there's an audience and try to imagine the comic timing that I would have used on stage and get it into a podcast recording and also keep my head 
uh, sort of aimed at the microphone as opposed to running all over the room, like with my Britney Spears mic. And so that's been a whole new skill um, that I'm nowhere near yet polishing. Uh, I, I listen to podcasts like yours, which seem so smooth and polished and the tone and the volume level remains consistent throughout. And I, I, I kind of wonder how you do it, but that's the goal. <laughs> Well, I think you're being too hard on yourself because, like I said, I've been listening to your um, the Trojan War podcast and now you um, the first two episodes of the Odyssey podcast. And uh, you are a professional, sir. And you, um, I love listening. I, I started listening to it in my car on my, my drives, but then I, I much more enjoy it like laying down before – before bed instead of reading i just listen oh to you're podcast. telling me it's a sedative that's what you're saying <laughs> not right? at all, oh, not oh, at see, all. See, knew... see what happens to people with unrelenting <laughs> standards i know what he's saying <laughs> no no i, I use your podcast I was to gonna... fall asleep <laughs> I was going to say I was going to say not to fall asleep but um just to to be able to sit there close your eyes and imagine the story. Um you are a wonderful storyteller. You're a, a funny storyteller too. Um I have loved the experience of listening to your podcast and I can't recommend them enough. Again, I haven't listened to all of uh Odyssey the podcast, but uh I know it's going to deliver because uh Trojan War did as well. That's you know the funny thing is I'm sure all artists face this or, you know, your creative products become like your, your babies. Um, I have struggled. Uh, and this is back to sort of something that's really interesting that I've talked to a lot of creative people about when I produced Trojan War, the podcast, I started that back in 2017. I think the only reason I started Trojan War, the podcast is because I had been invited in Ottawa to do a serialized telling of the Trojan War epic. And the concept initially was that I would go to a club every Sunday night and do an hour of the continuing story arc. And then I'd go back the next Sunday night and do the next hour of the story arc. And I thought about it and it was really flattering and really an exciting concept. And it occurred to me that the problem was that then it was going to take me about 25 Sunday nights in a row. And then I realized what was going to happen. And what was going to happen, of course, is that no human being in the world can show up for 25 Sunday nights in a row. I had an hour inside of this club that was willing to give me an hour. But what it was going to mean is that more and more, I was going to have to start off my hour of news story with backstory and context. And you can see what the problem would be. You know, by the time I got into about episode 10, by the time I'd brought all the new people up to date on it, I'd have five minutes for new content. So I suddenly realized it's not going to work. And I was racking my brain on how can I tell the entire story arc, like all the stories I want to tell and not have to leave any of them the cutting room floor. I thought, well, I'll demonstrate the problem by recording some of the episodes just to give this booking person who wanted to do this a sense of what the problem would be. So I got myself a mic. I sat down one day and I started recording and as a sample. And that meant I had to find recording software and somewhere about two days into the process of recording the story for this booking guy, and also so I had a document of the entire story, I thought, I wonder what would happen if I like tried to like turn this into like a podcast or something. And I was listening to a, the, the most famous history podcaster out there in the planet, like sort of the, the god of podcasting is a guy named Dan Carlin. Hardcore history. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, of course you knew. Um, and I'd been listening to Dan Carlin then because I'm a history geek. And I suddenly thought, well, Dan can do it with real history. Could I do it with my stuff that blends history and myth? And I mean, I knew I was, I, I still know reaching for the Dan Carlin as the sort of the exemplar was kind of reaching a little bit high up into the podcasting stratosphere, but he was the one that gave me the concept because what Dan Carlin can do is he can tell a story and he's a historian who can, you can lie awake at night and listen to like you do, you know, and go, wow, this is amazing. So the podcast concept simply only came as an accidental foray into uh, I want to be able to tell these stories. I need a way that I can serialize it. I can't serialize it live because I won't have an audience by the end of week 20. So what happens if I do it as a podcast? And the first few episodes of Odyssey or of Trojan War, the podcast, when I recorded them, 
it was really simply just for myself and I thought a few of my friends. And um, you don't know about those episodes because once I realized I was going to do this, uh, they got taken down right away. <laughs> they were <laughs> they were just, you know, Jeff hacking around with a microphone. But essentially, um, th- that was the process was figuring out um, the podcast was just a way of trying to find a new way of delivering the same thing that truth be told, I started doing 25 or 30 years ago inside of a high school grade nine English classroom in my second year of teaching, which was telling these stories. It was just a continuation of the same thing, uh, just a slightly different imagined audience, a slightly different presentation. But at the end of the day, kind of when I sat down and started recording the podcasts, it was full circle. And the other thing you'll see inside of Trojan War, the podcast and Odyssey, the podcast is um, my teacher voice. And you know, at the end of every episode of story, I have that 20 to 25 minute post story commentary. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I included those commentaries is that in my early drafts of Trojan War, the podcast, I kept wanting to interject my story and provide social and cultural context. It's being hardwired as a history teacher, right? You know, you get into the story and then you want to say, well, wait, let me give you a context. It's, I do this with my teenage, when my kids were teenagers, we'd be watching a movie together and I'd quit hitting, I'd hit pause all the time and say, wait, 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 you need some context here. There's a reference you're missing. And, you know, my kids would run screaming out of the room. So to avoid doing that with the podcast, what I decided to do is tell the story, tell the teacher to shut up and not get involved in the story. And then at the end, do my 15 or 20 minute post story commentary where I could put on the teacher hat and do all the kind of geeky fun stuff without ruining the flow of the story. And that was kind of the podcasting model I came up with. But that was trial and error. And once again, like most creative things, more accident than it was deliberate. Right. And uh, I just love what ended up coming out of it Um, started from, like you said, that, that first day teaching you know, then something that you were just doing for yourself. So you could have kind of a proof of concept and then it turned into, to something else. It's just like such great. I I love when those kinds of things end up coming to a final product, like, uh, like Trojan war or like the Odyssey. And like just a word of inspiration for anyone listening who's sort of at that sort of stage. Again, full disclosure, when I started to realize, hey, I'm going to create Trojan War, the podcast, well, suddenly not only was there this massive learning curve of having to figure out recording software and get a mic and learn how to use that and then learn how to build a website, like there was all that nuts and bolts, which were outside of my skill set. I was a storyteller, but suddenly I was going to be a storyteller that had to learn tech that was the daunting part, really. The the story part was easy. It was figuring out all the tech. But the other thing that, and my wife and I joke about this all the time, and my wife, I remember her when I came down once and I'd recorded the first three good episodes of Trojan War, the podcast, and played them. She asked me the question. She said, are are you enjoying this? And I said, yeah. And she said, what's your hope for this? And I said, I'm just I just want to document. I want to get it out there. And and she said, and it's become a bit of a family joke. She said, you know, Jeff, she said, as long as you're doing it because you love it. And we were in a very blessed position where I didn't need to do this to make money. And I I I have to say that because because everybody isn't in that position, and I'm eternally grateful that I had the support of being a teacher, and I had help when the concussion came, and I landed on my feet all right. So she turned to me and she said, "Jeff, do this if you're doing it because you love this." She said, "But what you really need to know, and what you've got to be ready for, is this is pretty arcane stuff. You'll likely be lucky if maybe ten, twenty, or thirty people ever really listen to it." So just make sure if you're putting all this work and time into it, it's because you want to do it and you're passionate about it because, you know, there's a lot of podcasts out there and it was really good advice. But the truth of the matter is when I started creating Trojan War, the podcast, I figured I'd be able to get my immediate family and relatives to listen because that's what's the point of having family and relatives if you can't subject them to your pet projects, right? <laughs> like <laughs> they have to listen. It's sort of like if you sell insurance, they have to buy it from you kind of. Mm-hmm. And, and then I thought maybe a few other people, but I had no idea at all that it would end up doing as well as it's done. 
And that was a total, total shock to me. And it's just, once again, for creative people, you know, you never know. Um, I was doing lots of other things at the time aside from the podcasting. I had a complete other show, which I was sure was going to be my breakthrough. Uh, the videos are still up in my storyteller thing. It was a series called How to Make Love in a Canoe. and they're- Which is awesome. Oh, you've seen? Yeah. Yeah. I'm really proud of those. I was sure for years that I was going to be touring that show and that that was going to be my future. And I put a year of my post-concussion life into, I still have another 10 How to Make Love in a Canoe live shows. It's just, the podcast was the thing that ended up opening doors. And so then when a door opens, um, I've been doing Trojan War for two years when I got an invitation a year ago from uh, Oxford University to come tell the stories inside of the city of Oxford to a whole bunch of inner city students who were doing classics and there was some government grant they had. So I got to fly overseas and tell my story and then, uh, you know, talk to profs at Oxford University and go tell my stories in one of those snobby British schools that looks like Hogwarts. And I didn't (laughs) know that was going to come. And then a year ago, again, because of the podcast, I got an email from this listener. She said, really enjoying your show. Um, My husband likes it too. And so I wrote back and said, oh, what do you do? And of course, she was a classics prof. And I said, oh, is your husband a prof? And she said, oh, no, he he works for such and such. And I'm not allowed to name the company uh, because of a disclosure when I did their show. But what I ended up doing is um, I wrote back and said, oh, really? He might be interested in my corporate show. And Youngman, I didn't have a corporate show. Uh, <laughs> um, no, he's- I, but I didn't have a corporate show. I just, one of the things I've learned how to do is to, um, and your other guests have talked about this kind of fake it sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, he might be interested, he might be interested in my corporate show. And, and she wrote back and said, what is it? I said, oh, well, what I do is I, I have this corporate show called Leadership Lessons from a Bronze Age War. And it, it's sort of, I do it for CEOs and executives. I go in and I, I I tell the story of the Trojan War epic, but I mine it for leadership theory and behavioral economic principles. And it creates a safe distance so that the CEOs sitting in the room can look at modern behavioral economics and teamwork and leadership theory without feeling as though they're squirming because I'm talking about their company, because I'm talking about how Agamemnon got, you know, screwed over by sunk cost fallacy or how, you know, Achilles got mistaken because of his confirmation bias and, and all of that sort of thing. And I I kind of BSed my way through this. Two weeks later, I got an email from, uh, you know, the senior vice president of this company saying, um, I'm doing a workshop for the senior management and retreat. We're looking for something new. Can you come in and tell me about your show? (laughs) So guess what I did for the next week and a half? (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yeah, I kind of went in and um, um, kind of, you know, put on that deadpan game face enthusiasm and avoided telling any lies, but didn't tell any truths either. Like, like, yes, I'm going to be writing this show if you give me the gig. And um, they gave me the gig. Um, and the beauty about the private sector is the private sector has real money. <laughs> right. Who'd have thunk it? Uh, <laughs> you know, the education sector has money, but the private sector had real money. And now I've done a few shows. I've got uh, my Bronze Age uh, Tro- Trojan War corporate show, and I've done a entire deconstruction of the Odyssey as the Odyssey, a parable of failed leadership. And I go through Odysseus's entire journey home as a series of to do errors that CEOs make and blunders that they make in trying to navigate their ship of whatever their ship is to its destination. And it's been a real hoot. But again, I think one of the things I've slowly come to learn is that you're not sure which doors are going to open, which are going to be dead ends. I'm telling you about all the doors that opened, but I have thrown a whole lot of shit against the wall and put my heart and soul into proposals and ideas and different options. I've talked to cruise ship companies about, hey, we'll go to the Aegean. I'll, I, I, I put together a detailed walking tour with the tour company about, I'll be a traveling bard and we can do a tour of Greece and I'll be your traveling bard and I'll tell Trojan War epic stories every night inside of the hotel in the evening after we see the, after we go to Delphi, I'll tell you the story that happened at Delphi and all of those things and none of them have come up. And that's the only other thing I think is really critical for listeners to recognize is 
the journey to successes is paved with failures. <laughs> mm. I've sent so many proposals out for so many different ways that I could spin this material. And, you know, you follow the leads and you hope they'll work out and then nothing happens. And then out of the blue, some guy says, hey, apparently you do this corporate thing and you go in and it turns into a whole new series of ventures and gigs for you that you didn't know were going to happen. Um, it, it's easy afterwards if you're listening to somebody's happy ending story to forget that the creative stuff and creating a product which people are actually going to consume and care about involves not only your whole creative side, but a massive amount of time spent just working your ass off at sending out feelers and hoping people will look at your product and finding new ways of packaging your product and accepting that most of the time you're going to come up empty. Right. You just got to keep putting yourself out there and find creative ways to uh, not just repurpose your, your content, but to make it more valuable for more people as well. Yeah. And I have a brother-in-law in insurance sales and business, that kind of thing. He's a salesman and he does very well. And he says that his ratio of landed contracts from first contact initiations, he figures for every 100 initiations he puts out there, he gets 10 responses, which lead to more work and more communication. And out of those 10 he considered it a successful year if one of them turns into a signed contract. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I mean, he said that's a pretty standard sort of sales and marketing ratio. Um, I think for creative people, most of us hate doing that part of the job. We would love to be able to just produce our podcasts or for me, write my shows and rehearse my performances. For me, the hardest part still is getting the gigs um, and the time it takes getting the gigs. And with my concussion and things like that, the thing I struggle with the most now is I still only have X number of hours in a day. I have way more than one hour a day. I'm like, you get better. You learn how to deal with an injury and manage and use your time. But there's still not nearly enough hours in a day to do the creative end of it and produce new creative product and also to be out there hustling and shilling and hauling ass to get people to actually hire you to perform your product. And so I wake up every morning dancing between uh, how do I find that ratio of doing stuff and finding people who will listen to stuff. And the finding people to listen stuff is hard work. And it's soul destroying if you're not a natural salesperson, but it's got to be done. <laughs> right. Jeff, this has been awesome, but it's time for the final push. And that's where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your best final words of advice and really push them to pursue their own creative passions. Wow. Okay. In under five minutes too, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can, I, I, however long you want. Yeah. I've, I've been listening to your inspirational final pushes in your episodes and, and, and it's a pretty daunting task to try to package the whole thing, but I've, I've given it some thought. So, so forgive my blunt language, but here's, here are the conclusions folks that I've reached from my own experience. Number one, uh, I've come to the conclusion that shit happens. I got a feeling that shit is just the human condition, that you're going to wake up some morning and it's going to come unexpected. It's going to not be something you could plan for. Definitionally, when shit happens, it's unexpected shit. And when that happens, well, then your life is turned upside down. Now, when it happens to you, and here comes me trying to reach through the microphone, here's the journey you've got to go through. First of all, don't deny it. So many people I talk to, when some traumatic, life-changing event happens, try to pretend as though it never really happened. But folks, if you're listening now, your shit is real, it's legitimate, and you are allowed to grieve, you are allowed to bargain, you're allowed to get really, really angry about it. And as far as I'm concerned, that's all normal, it's necessary, and I would even go as far as to say it's a healthy part of the process. So, once that's in place, Next piece of advice, don't try to go it alone. 
because you're going to need help with two specific things. First off, there is a whole practical end of what you do when shit happens. So if your shit is physical shit, like mine was getting whacked in the side of the head, well, you got to find yourself a doctor. You got to figure out what's going on inside of my brain. What are the new conditions inside of my physical realities? But but your shit might not be physical. It might be financial. In that case, you got to talk to an accountant. And if it's legal, God forbid, well, then you've got to be talking to a lawyer. But it's really critical that in the early days, as soon as you can, you get a sense of, okay, this is what I am physically up against. Here are the realities. Now, that part, that part I find pretty easy. But when I talk to people who have gone through concussions or whatever, I find that the part that they find really hard and the next stage of the process is getting the psychological stuff all figured out. And well, folks, my experience is that most people, they can deal with the physical stuff. They can talk to the doctor. They can talk to the lawyer. They can talk to the accountant. But when it gets to the psychological stuff, most of us have a desire and a tendency deeply hardwired into us to try to go that part alone. And really, I, I don't know why we do it. I, I was talking to some friends about this the other day, and they said, well, that's personal. I don't want to talk to people. And somebody else said, well, I grew up in a family where you don't share your feelings. And another guy said, I'm not going to talk to a psychologist or a psychiatrist because only sick people do that. But look, you got to talk. You've got to talk to somebody who's a professional and figure out how your life has changed. And, you know, if you don't do that, I don't really think you can move on to getting better. So when you get to that stage, go get professional help, figuring out the physical part of the shit that happened to you. But then you're going to have to dive deeply in to how that shit has changed your psychological outlet. And you got to deal with that stuff too. So now on to the fun stuff. Once you've got to that stage, then what you can do is you can set back and you can take some sort of an inventory. Now, if you're lucky and you're listening and you had, before the shit happened to you, some amazing creative life where you were producing like really good stuff and you felt like, yeah, it's coming together for me. I am generating something I value and I'm passionate about. Then, of course, you're going to be really scared when the shit happens and you're afraid you won't be able to do that again. So at this stage, all I can suggest is take a deep breath, sit back and see if you can kind of parse out what was core or what was central to what it was you were doing before whatever it was happened to you. So just to give you an example of this, because this is kind of crazy, but in my case, when I got whacked in the side of the head, I was absolutely convinced that I was a high school teacher. Now I couldn't teach high school and my freaking life was over. But after I got the physical help, after I talked to the psychologist and figured out that bit, then what I could do is sit back and realize that the core or the essential part of what I was doing as a high school teacher was telling people stories and helping people through stories to learn things. And once I figured that out, then what I started to do is go looking for new ways to do what I've been doing all along, just not inside of the high school classroom. So I started keeping my eyes and ears open for ways I might be able to tell stories, ways I might be able to educate people that I never, ever even considered before. Now, that sounds really, really nice, but here's the truth. It's going to take a while. It's not like you're going to wake up some morning, somebody's going to phone you and say, hey, here's a new way you can do all the creative stuff you used to do. <laughs> it's going to take a long time. But try to keep yourself open to the baby steps. If somebody says, hey, you used to paint, try doing this. If it has something to do with painting, hey, you used to act, try doing this. And slowly, when you take the baby steps, you'll start to see other doors open for you. I don't know how long those doors will take to open. I don't know what those doors will look like. But I can promise you this. Someday, you will wake up You'll look back on the darkest days of the shit that happened to you, and you'll recognize that once again, you are producing something you care about, something you are passionate about, and it'll catch you by surprise, but you'll realize that you're happy again and that you're doing good work. And that's all I have, but I really believe it. I believe that shit's going to happen, 
and that we come out the other end of the shit. And when we do, we're stronger, happier, more dynamic and vibrant people for it. So hang in, go through the steps and you're going to be just fine. And that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> well, that is profound, man. That, that That's good. Shit does happen, but you really set up a good roadmap for what to do when that shit happens to get through it. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I believe it. It's my own story. You'll have to try it out for yourself, folks, but I think it works. And everybody I've talked to who's been through the shit journey, <laughs> hey, we're calling it the shit journey now. Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm right back into my Odyssey stuff, but everybody nice. <laughs> who's been through the journey basically says that, yeah, these are the steps. This is a process you got to go through. And there are no shortcuts. But, you know, changing our metaphor, there is light at the end of the shit tunnel. <laughs> Okay, Absolutely. I better shut up because it's just going to get really rude now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it, man. Yeah. Jeff, man, th thank you so much for coming on the show today, for uh, sharing your story. Um, like I said, your podcasts, both of them uh, are amazing. I can't wait to, to listen to the rest of the Odyssey. Um, just thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing your story. Oh, that was so much fun. And thanks for being so patient and listening to me ramble on as – I want to do. No, <laughs> uh, no it's great, man. Yeah, it's so exciting to it will be part of your podcasting community. Like, do you ever have this fantasy where you wish you could take all of your guests, bring them into the room or bring them off to some condo for a weekend just so you could talk about the shared experiences? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that would be so amazing. I, I And thank you for doing what you're doing because I find myself – going back and trying to figure out from the titles, because you have so many interviews, you can't listen to all of them, uh, to find the one that I go, which one's going to help me now? And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, everybody has their own little take on the story. So all you got was, I, I guess, where I am right now with mine. Very cool. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for the kind words. And uh, yeah, I, I hope that the <laughs> podcast continue to inspire you as well. For everybody listening, you can find Jeff's latest podcast uh, at odysseythepodcast.com. You can find Trojan War at trojanwarpodcast.com. And you can find everything else about Jeff at jeffwrightstoryteller.com. And again, we'll have that all linked up at today's show notes page, yourcreativepush.com slash 334. Jeff, thanks again, man. Thanks a lot, man. Have a great day, young one. You too. Huge thank you to Jeff once again for coming on the show. One of my favorite episodes, one of my favorite final pushes as well, and also one of the longest episodes of Your Creative Push. Actually, I think it was the longest episode to date. Um, so I will give you a very, very, very brief <laughs> uh, outro here. So I just want to remind you to learn your demons' names, like Jeff said in the episode. Find those things that are overpowering you or the things that you are afraid to face every single day the resistances that you can't even bring out of your subconscious bring to the surface and face bring them to the surface learn their names learn the things that are holding you back every single day even if they are as simple or as embarrassing as laziness or addiction to Instagram or addiction to Facebook or addiction to YouTube, give them a name. Once you give those monsters or those demons a name, you can step up to them and you can defeat them. On our next episode, we have Nick Rungi. Nick is a painter from Los Angeles. And he comes on the show next week for the next of a long streak of incredibly inspiring episodes i recorded these before i moved out of my place in maryland and i have been just beaming with excitement to get these out to you all seriously some great stuff coming out for you uh, but in terms of next week if you want to find out more about nick you can head to his website at nickrungiart.com or on instagram he is nick v rungi you spell his last name r-u-n-g-e or you can head to today's show notes page, yourcreativepush.com slash 334. There you will find those links as well as everything we talked about today with Jeff and everywhere you can find Jeff from his storytelling stuff to his Trojan War podcast and Odyssey podcast. I highly recommend 
you check them out. But that's all I've got for you today. So hopefully you were inspired to go and get your creative work done, to go on your own journey, to go on your own odyssey. Keep creating some amazing stuff. Keep naming your demons, naming your monsters, and conquering them every single day. I love you all so much. Go get some amazing work done, and we will see you next time, the time after that, and the time after that, as you keep creating some amazing work. Keep going on your odyssey and keep crushing your creative life. I love you all so much. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.